Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and I'd like to talk about my analysis phase in my instructional systems design methodologies. Um, I've uh, previously met with my project steering team. They've handpicked the master performers and other subject matter experts to work with me. Um, they've made that a job assignment for those master performers and subject matter experts, those other subject matter experts. And I don't have to pull teeth to get them to uh, participate with me in this instructional design effort, this learning experience design development effort. Um, it's been deemed a high stakes performance situation that the project steering team wants to see addressed. And therefore, I usually get uh, greater cooperation than it is if I didn't have their kind of support. Now, when I do analysis, I do four types of analysis. The first type is target audience analysis. The second is performance analysis and a gap analysis. The third is the enabling knowledge and skill analysis. And my fourth is what I call training and development uh, assessments for existing content to determine its reuse potential. Will I be able to reuse this content as is, or after modification, or perhaps it's not appropriate. It just sounded good in the title, but when you look at it, it's really not relevant to the performance and the enabling knowledge and skills that we previously uncovered. And I tend to do those four types of analysis in that order. Target audience tells me um, the demographics, you know, how many people are there, where are they in the world or the uh, territory uh, of perform their performance context. Um, what are their educational backgrounds? What are their experience backgrounds? Are they newbies to the whole effort right out of college? Or are they tradespeople that have probably come from other companies doing similar kinds of things? You know, could, because if they're all electrical de engineers, degreed electrical engineers, and ACDC electrical theory is a requirement and enabling knowledge and skills, then we're pretty darn sure that we don't have to cover that. They're going to be part of their incoming uh, knowledge and skills, their prior knowledge and skills. So understanding the target audience and what today is known as doing personas, um, my goal has always been to understand what can I safely generalize about the target audience that would be true. Now this is going to impact the design and the modular front end of my instruction, whatever it is I'm trying to create, so that I can modularize it so that people can either skip it by just they and their boss deciding that they probably already know this and they don't need to take it, or that we can do testing out mechanisms to help uh, confirm that they know the content already and there's nothing worse for people than being trained on things that they already know. Um, and we can modularize this content so that it can be personalized. So it's got per, uh, it's performanceized first, it's modularized second so that it can be personalized by the individuals that are gonna be taking the instruction. So that usually uh, has an effect to the modularization of the front end of the instruction and perhaps throughout it, but it's usually all on the front end. So I wanna understand that target audience. Then what I wanna understand about that target audience is what are their performance requirements back on the job? And are those the same for everybody with the same job title or does that vary because they could have an assignment and do part of the work of the whole and a couple, a few people, a few, a, a small percentage of the population does everything A to Z or Z, um, or that there are some people who just really work on the vowels and other people work on the consonants or however it's divided up here. Because one thing that if you've been in the business for a while, you should know that just because people have the same job title doesn't mean they have the same job responsibilities. And the performance analysis is to frame the performance requirements. Uh, I chunk it out into what I call areas of performance, but it's similar to uh, accomplishments, major duties, key results areas. There's a lot of language for this, but basically it's a blocking it all out so that we can do further detailed analysis of all those blocks. In the instructional design world, the ADDI model might be one part where there's the A, the first D, the second D, the I, and the E, and that constitutes it doesn't really, but it constitutes, you know, one way to frame the performance of an instructional designer. So we're going to do something equivalent to that. And then we're going to go deep on each one of those things and figure out, well, what are the outputs in that first chunk of the job, the first area of performance? 
What are the tasks associated with this? This is where task analysis comes in, but in my approach, it's always related to a deliverable, an output, a physical kickable output most of the time. Sometimes outputs are uh, decisions we make, they're in our head, they never, make, they never make it to a physical manifestation, but they are outputs nonetheless. But I'm really looking for the big outputs. You know, there's an analysis report, a design document, there's actual content that's produced, a pilot test report, uh, and then, you know, other things. Um, so I want to understand that performance, and I want to understand ideal performance from the master performers. What are the outputs? What are the measures for those outputs? In other words, how do you tell a good output from a bad one? That's the simple way to look at it. But what are the quality dimensions, the quantity dimensions, the cost dimensions, the time dimensions, etc.? Many ways to frame uh, measures of outputs. Um, and that's where eventually we'll, we'll be doing the evaluation to find out if do we make improvements to the production of outputs given whatever measures are appropriate to that output. And then that's, if that's ideal performance, and I also want to know for all those tasks, who does what? Is it just the job, people in the job title? Or are there other players in the sandbox of performance, so to speak? And so who's doing what? Where do they collaborate and do things together? Where do they go off, go off and do their own thing and come together? Um, I want to understand all of that, the performance context. And I want to understand then next, what are the gaps? For the people who wouldn't be called master performers, where are they struggling? So what measures for the outputs do they not meet? And master performers tend to know these things um, just because they do. That's been my experience. So they can often articulate you know, exactly what outputs are of issue, what the measures are, not all of them, but what are the key measures that uh, the non-master performers typically don't meet. And they have their opinions as to what the probable causes are. I typically don't have time to go do a root cause analysis and ask why five times or more to determine, you know, what's really at the root of this issue here. But off the tops of the heads, you know, what's the ideal performance and what are the gaps? What are the probable causes, as I said, and which of those then are attributable back to a deficiency of the performer's knowledge and skills, a deficiency of the performer's uh, other human attributes and values. Uh, perhaps the uh, probable cause is really due to deficiency in the environment and the environmental supports, or perhaps the deficiency is due to a faulty process, or there's a process that nobody adheres to, or there just ain't no process, and everybody's winging it. And master performers have figured out how to wing it with, without a, a formal process in place, but they figured out their own way of doing things. And so I work to understand all of that so that I can do the third uh, step uh, type of analysis, which is what are the enabling knowledge and skills? Now I have 17 enabling knowledge and skill categories. It's a lot I know. Um, and not every category is used in every project, but I've had a couple of projects where they were appropriate to be used for all of them. So the first thing I often wanna know are you know, what are the uh, uh, company policies and procedures? And the next, what I want to know is what are the uh, 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 laws, regulations, and codes that uh, govern performance? And in a highly regulated business, if I cover the company policies and procedures, I don't have to do, do the uh, uh, laws, regulations, and codes because the policies and procedures usually cover those adequately. But if you're not in a highly regulated business, Policies and procedures, you know, ideally in an ideal world, they would cover the laws, regulations, and codes, but master performers know where there's other things that aren't addressed on the policies and procedures or aren't clear enough, and they know what the real uh, measures are on their performance, and they know what those laws, regulations, and codes are to a great extent. And there's other, so there's many other categories, and I use those to, to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. So I take what I've documented on the performance requirements, the ideal performance and the gap performance, and use that to stimulate thinking of my master performers and subject matter experts to begin to elicit from them, well, what do you gotta know about laws, regulations, and codes? And what do you gotta know about tools and equipment? And what about interpersonal skills as we're doing various chunks of the job? And it's very systematic and it drives people crazy. And I tell them this is the most tedious part of my process because it is. But it also it guarantees that I've uh, uncovered uh, to as great an extent as possible, nothing is perfect, but I've been able to elicit from them 
the enabling knowledge and skills that are required by the performers in order to meet the performance requirements. And that's necessary from an instructional design standpoint to understand more than tasks, but what are the outputs, what are the measures, what are the, what are the uh, gaps in performance in the current state performance, and what do you got to know to be able to do. And so that's the goal. And once I'm armed with all of that data, then I can go assess existing content to see what might be reused. You know, why reinvent the wheels? Why not use what the prior shareholder investments uh, have been in terms of creating information and instruction? Not everything that's created by uh, ISDers is legitimately called instruction. Sometimes it's really just information. But if, it's, if, but if it exists, then we ought to try to reuse it to as great an extent as possible, but not use it if it's inappropriate. So those are the four types of analysis data. I document all of that in an analysis report, and I create a project steering team gate review meeting presentation specific to that particular gate review meeting where we're going to be reviewing the analysis data. And I walk my project steering team through all that data. Now, if we're meeting as a group, that's best because then when people take exception and want to understand certain things, they're all part and privy to that discussion about the analysis data, questioning it, the language that's used, because sometimes it's just a semantics issue and we need to you know, resolve, reconcile all of that as quickly as possible. But um, sometimes you have to go to each individual project steering team member one-on-one. -on -one, and one person says one thing, another person says something different, and then you know you've got to reconcile that between those two people. The third person says something entirely different or agrees with the, one of the two of the first people. And, you know, that's just uh, uh, extends the length of a project, the cost of a project. But sometimes if you can't get all the people together in the right room to meet face to face or virtually, then you're doing this, you know, kind of one off with each one of the project steering team members. But the goal is to get the project steering team members to approve the data that you're going to be working with in design and later on in development, or to modify it for whatever reason uh, that they see appropriate, or to uh, exclude some of that data because they don't think it's worthy of addressing and they want it, don't want it addressed, um, or they reject it, send you back to go do analysis and go get the right information. However, if you've gamed this appropriately, excuse me, manipulated this appropriately, excuse me, set this up appropriately, you will have gotten the project steering team to handpick the master performers and other subject matter experts, the documents that you needed to review if that was necessary. And when the word comes back and, it does, and they don't agree with it or don't like it, then it's a dilemma that they face because they handpick your sources. And if this is what the source says, and the sources concede to this, there's a consensus on this data, then like it or not, now we have a dilemma. And the project steering team, you know, we're working for them, they get to handle those dis uh, dilemmas. Those are business decisions, not instructional design decisions in my mind. And they need to wrestle with those things and get them resolved so that we can move forward with confidence that we're working on the right stuff with the right inputs to the design step, which is next. And so that's what I do when I'm doing instructional analysis, those four types. I take all that data and put it together and I do a readout to my project steering team. I don't take them down every little rabbit hole and all the data I covered at a high level and allow them to go deep when they want to. I've got the data there, I've given it to them, but I don't force them to go through and read every last word on every last page. I review that for them to see if there are certain areas that they want to probe further to do their due diligence as managers, as stakeholders in this effort. And again, because they've handpicked the master performers, if what I'm bringing back to them is a consensus from those master performers, then they've got to begin to trust that data. In fact, they may not be able to do a, an adequate assessment of the data because they don't do that job for a living. And that was why we wanted to pick the master performers that had credibility with the project steering team members to generate the data in the first place. This is Guy Wallace talking about instructional systems design or learning experience design or whatever you like to call it. Thank you.